Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Guangbing Huang uh, from uh, Nanyang Technology University of Singapore, uh, NTU. Uh, so he uh, is talking about uh, his uh, low interest uh, research in extreme learning uh, machine. Uh, he graduated from uh, Northeastern University in China in applied mathematics and uh, has been uh, with uh, NTU for quite a few years. And uh, he's associate editor of Neuro Computing and also attribute transactions on uh, system man and the cyber cybernetics. Uh, and uh, he's organizing a workshop. You can advertise your <laughs> your, your conference uh, later on. So Thank you. Uh, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Zhang for <coughs> inviting me here. It's my uh, honor to give a talk to introduce the extreme learning machine. Uh, this is uh, actually the idea was initially uh, initiated in nine, uh, actually 2003, the first time we submitted papers. And then it become a uh, recognized by more and more researchers recently. So we just had a workshop in Australia uh, last December. So we are going to have an international symposium on extreme learning machine this coming December in China, which is Dr. Zhang's hometown, or nearby his hometown. So welcome, you can join. Okay, <clears throat> so what is uh, extreme learning machine? Uh, actually, this is a, a technique talk about, talking about the uh, kind of learning method. Such a learning method is, is it different from the traditional learning method. So tuning is not required, right? So if we, talk about, if we wish to know extreme learning machine, I think it's better to go back to review the traditional feed forward neural, neural networks, including supported vector machines. Although many people consider supported, uh, supported vector machines do not belong to neural networks. But actually, in my opinion, later I will show they have the same uh, target, same architecture in some aspects, in some sense. So after we review feed forward neural networks, then we can go to the uh, it, to introduce what is called extreme learning machine. Actually, extreme learning machine is very, very simple. Okay, during my talk, I also <coughs> wish to give the comparison between the ERM and the Lisa Square SVM. So finally, uh, I wish to show the linkage between the ERM and also the traditional uh, SVM, so now we know what's the difference, what's the relationship, okay? So the feed forward neural network I have the several types of famous architectures. One of the popular ones is multi-layer feed forward neural networks. But then in theory and also in applications, people found a single hidden layer is enough for us to handle uh, all the applications in theory. So that means given any applications, we can design a single hidden layer feed forward network. Uh, this feed of single hidden layer feed forward network can be used for us to approximate <coughs> any continuous target function, can be used for us to classify any disjoint regions. Okay, so for single hidden layer feed forward networks, Usually, we also have the two types of popular arch architectures. The first one is the so-called uh, sigmoid type of uh, feed-forward network. So that means the hidden layer here use 
sigmoid of type letter work, okay? Sometimes I call additive hidden nodes. That means the input of the, the input of each hidden node is a weighted uh, sum of the input, okay? So of course, GE here usually people using sigmoid type of uh, function. But you, we can also write the output hidden layer, uh, output uh, hidden node as upcase G, right? So A, I, B, I, and X. X is the input uh, of the letter work. A, I, B, I are the hidden layer parameters for each, say for hidden node I, the A, I, B, I are the parameters of the node I, right? So this is the sigmoid type of hidden uh, field for letter work. Of course, another one is very, very popular is RBF letter work. So RBF letter work here, the hidden node output function is RBF function. So, but if we write then in this uh, computer format, we actually have the same uh, so-called output function of the uh, single hidden layer field forward network as uh, sigmoid type network. So here you also upcase G. Okay, so these two type of networks uh, is very interesting in the past two to three decades, two group of people, researchers <laughs> work on these two areas. They consider them separate. So they use a different learning method for these two method, uh, networks. But generally, for both type of letter works, we have this uh, so-called uh, theorem. So given any target continuous function, fx, so the output function of this single hidden layer can be uh, used per, to, uh, can be as close as to this uh, target continuous function, uh, given any error. Uh, definitely in theory, we can find such a network so that the output of this network can be as close as to this uh, <coughs> target function fx. Of course, uh, <coughs> in real applications, we do not know the target function fx, right? Uh, so in single processing, we have a sampling. We only can sample the discrete samples. And we wish to learn these uh, discrete samples, training samples. So we wish to adjust the parameters of the hidden layer and also the width between the hidden layer to the output layer. Try to find some algorithm to learn these parameters to make sure the output of the letter work to approximate to approximate a target function. Okay? So generally, from learning point of view, so given we given say n uh, training samples. X i t i, so we wish to have the letter work uh, output of the letter work with, re with respect to the input x j equal to your uh, target output t j, right? Of course, some in most cases your output not exactly the same as your target. So there are some error there. Suppose the output of the letter work is OJ, so we wish to minimize this cost function, right? So in order to do this, many people, right, uh, actually spend uh, time uh, finding different methods, right, on how to tune the hidden layer parameters A, I, B, I, and also the width between the hidden layer to the output layer, that is beta i, which is I call output width, right? So, <clears throat> so that is the situation for the learning. So that is for approximation, but how about the classification? So in my theory, uh, published in the year 2000, we say as long as this kind of hidden, uh, single hidden layer feed forward network can approximate any target function. This network, in theory, can be used to, for us to classify any disjoint regions, right? So this is a classification yeah, case. So yeah. Actually, so there's a very well-known result in neural network <coughs> research, you probably know about, yeah. uh, which says that uh, in order for the, what you said, the universal approximation to be valid, the number of units had to be very, very large. And then if you get infinite, 
you actually approximate what's called the Gaussian process. Yeah, you are you are right. So that, that gives a lot of implication of what can you talk about here, right? Uh, okay, that that is uh, actually very useful uh, theory. That one actually is used for further uh, development. So that is why we come to extreme learning machine. That is a guide, but an infinity number of hidden nodes usually not required in real application. But in theory, in order to approximate any target function, say epsilon, the error reaching zero, then in that sense, infinite number of new, uh, hidden nodes uh, needs to be uh, given. But in real application, we do not need that. So I will mention later. But that theory is very, very important. Okay? Without a, mm -hmm. So uh, recently, when people uh, observed that if you have many layers, actually you can make it better than a single layer system, even if you have very uh, large number of hidden units in your single layer system. Yeah, you, you, you are right. So this, we have another paper, actually I didn't mention here, that is say, we prove, say, instead of say three hidden layers, just talk about two hidden layers, compare one hidden layer of architecture. So two hidden layers of network usually need much fewer number of hidden nodes than single hidden layer. So in theoretical. I, yeah, I, I proved it in theoretical and also showing in simulations. So that means that from learning capability point of view, much hidden layer looks more powerful, right? So, but that is, we, we actually is not shown here, okay? That one we can discuss later. Okay, so then in order to learn these kind of networks, so then in the past two decades, so most people are using gradient-based uh, learning method, right? So one of the most popular one is backpropagation, of course. And it's variant, so many variants. People talk about just some parameters, they generate a lot of learning method, okay? Another method is called for RBF later on. So talk about this square method. But in this this square method is uh, some kind of uh, something different from our ERM, which we will introduce later. So single hidden, so single impact factor used in all hidden nodes. That means in all hidden nodes, they use the, all hidden nodes use the same impact factor, impact width, okay, sometimes it's called sigma, right? Okay, so what's the, uh, drawbacks of those gradient-based method or uh, so usually we will fear very difficult in research. So different group of researchers work on different network. Actually, in uh, intuitive, intuitively speaking, they have the similar architectures, but usually RBF network researchers work on RBF. So feed forward network people work on feed forward network. So they. They, are, they consider the little work are different. So we actually sometimes waste the resources. And also, uh, in all the uh, little work, users, it's actually inconvenient to users. You have sometimes so many parameters for users to tune manually, right? It's case by case, okay? So it's sometimes inconvenient for long expert users, okay? So it's usually we also face overfitting issues. So this is why if too many use the number of hidden nodes used in hidden layer, we will face a problem, overfitting problem, right? So we will face a headache, okay? And also, right, for RBF, a local minimum, right? So you can't get the optimum solution. Usually get a local minimum solution. That is better for that local area, but not for the general, the, the, the entire applications. Of course, time consuming. Time consuming not only on learning itself, and also on actually on human effort. Human has to spend time to find the uh, so-called proper parameters, user-specified parameters. So we wish to overcome all these uh, limitations, constraints in the uh, uh, original learning methods. Now let's look at the supervised machine. Is there any relationship between a spider variety machine and the traditional feed forward network? Of course, when SVM people talk about SVM, they never talk about neural network, they say they're separate. So this is why there was, there was a story. So when I joined the uh, IJCN uh, in 2004, uh, before 2004, SVM paper is uh, 
seldom they appear in neural network conference. So then in 2004, the organizer of 2004 write the talk. We have a committee, we, we committee meeting, and say, uh, why this year so many SVM papers come to neural network conference? Okay, so people consider these are different. But what I found, actually, they are very close to each other. In general speaking, they are the same, in the same network architecture. Let's look at the SVM. So let's, SVM, of course, if we talk about the op optimization objective, SVM is to op uh, minimize this formula, right? So these objective functions, so minimize the width, the op actually output width plus the training error under these inequality conditions, right? But then look at the final solution, decision of SVM is this decision. But watch this. K here is a kernel of the SVM, all right? Alpha STS is the parameter we want to find. Okay, but look at this formula. This actually exactly is a single hidden layer feed forward letter. What is single hidden layer? Single hidden layer formed by the hidden with these kernels, right? So KX, X1, KX, X2, XI, 2, KX, XN. So this is the hidden layer, right? This is the kernel, hidden layer with this kernel. So what is the output width then? Output width is alpha 1, T1, alpha I, Ti, alpha N, Tn. That is the output width. That is the beta I in feed forward and later work. Okay, yeah, please. This is not from the beginning of SVM. If you look in fact that next book, he has exactly the same interpretation of SVM. Okay, yeah, this is not objective of the SVM, but finally it turned out to be in this uh, formula. So I say from the architecture point of view, so finally they had a similar rela uh, architecture. When, when Batman started working on SVMs uh, under ARPA, uh -huh. um, the project was called New Ways to Train Neural Networks. So there was a connection from the beginning, and it was exactly this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so actually, yeah, you, you will talk about the WebLeak paper in, published in 1995. So WebLeak, what is the so-called inspiration, inspiration to WebLeak? So WebLeak say, actually, they have to go back to the original uh, neural network. Okay, so ResNode, ResNode, uh, uh, actually in 1962, ResNode, uh, Study the multi-layer feed forward network. In those days, he found has no idea how to tune in the hidden layer. So then ResNet said, how about we consider the last layer? Ignore the hidden layer. If we consider last the hidden layer, last hidden layer is output mapping function, looks output mapping mapping function. So then can we find some way to to just find the output uh, the last hidden layer output function, that is a feature map function. Then you ignore the rest. So then WebNIC say, okay, so what is the, uh, so the output function of the last hidden layer, or oh, that it can be considered is phi xi. But what is phi xi? I have no idea. So then in WebNIC paper say, how about net phi x unknown? So we have this kind of uh, constraint because this is very important for classification. Under this constraint, they finally get this. So although the output hidden layer uh, mapping function, that is the uh, SVM fixture mapping function, phi x is unknown, but we can find the corresponding uh, kernel. So this will come to this uh, stage. But actually, I'm not challenging the idea of SMM. I'm talking about from a structure point of view, if we go to this stage, finally turn out to be in the same for format. Of course, from here, the question is, how to find alpha i t s? How to find alpha i t s is how to find this output width, right? So you will consider the hidden layer feed forward network. Feed forward hidden network also try to find a parameter. So SVM and the traditional BP and so on, in this sense, is either just different ways to find the parameters of the hidden layer feed forward network, single hidden layer feed forward networks. SVM find it in SVM format, BP find it in BP format, RBF find it in RBF format. So this is why different people find uh, methods in different ways. So then the question is, can we unify them? Okay, so this, this is uh, 
one of my <coughs> uh, so-called research work. Okay, actually, in order to say uh, to to show the linkage between the SVM and the single hidden layer feed forward network, I think that people uh, better read these two papers. Okay, because these two papers also. Uh, give me some idea, inspire my ideas. They build the linkage between the ERM uh, and SVM first. So then I found this linkage also. Okay, so now let's go back to the, let's go to the talk about uh, extreme learning machine. Of course, extreme learning machine originally started from the neural networks. We come from neural networks. So those days we, we try to say, okay, we start from BP network. The BP we found is inefficient. But what is the essence, what is the original expectation for neural network? We try to emulate human thinking. But human can think something, can find a solution very quickly. So the question is, do we have tuning in human brain? But usually, to me, it's no tuning there in most cases, right? Just find a solution directly. Or I can learn very fast, right? Either very fast, either without tuning. But if you go back to the original learning method of the <coughs> neural network, super information, you see, always tuning is there, right? Always have to find the parameters there. Can we have some way to simplify the implementation of the computational intelligence method? So then we found, we first, we from all this architecture point of view, we see all can be uh, simplified in this single hidden layer feed forward networks. So always hidden layer, right, A, I, B, I. But hidden layer here, hidden node may not be neuron. You can be a kernel. You can be other sub work even. But each hidden layer has a parameter, A, I, B, I. Uh, those are the parameters. If we ignore the uh, real formula of each output hidden, uh, uh, each uh, output function of the hidden node, right, details, we just write them in this compact format. Okay, so then the output of this output function of this network is fx equal to summation of uh, uh, <coughs> beta i g a i b i x g a i b i x actually is the output function of the i's hidden node. Okay, it can be RBF network kernel. It can be uh, so called the sigmoid type network. If something else, even even can be long differential network, threshold network. Okay, so then you see this hidden layer, the entire hidden layer. What is the output of the entire hidden layer? The entire put, the entire hidden layer. Suppose we have n. Suppose the entire hidden layer has a all hidden nodes. So then the output layer. What is the output layer? The output layer is h x is the vector of these a all uh, elements of these uh, the out fu output functions output of this AO hidden nodes, right? It's a vector. HX here is the fixture mapping. It's a hidden layer fit of um, so-called output mapping, right? Okay, so in this case, the question is, in the traditional method, AI, BI, AL, A1, B1, AL, BL, all have to be tuning there. So this is why we have to have the gradient based method or SVM method, because you see, if this parameter, say parameter hidden layer has been tuned. The result you obtain in the early stage in the output layer, right, beta i here may not be optimum. You have to adjust the output layer again. If you adjust the output layer, the beta i, uh, beta 1 to beta, I, uh, beta l, then the parameter in the hidden layer may, may not be optimal further anymore. So you have to adjust again. So this is why you always have to adjust the, Right, iteratively. So then, luckily, in our theory, we found tuning in the hidden layer actually is not required. All the parameters in the hidden layer can be random generated. Uh, this go back to your. So this assume infinity number of hidden nodes can be used. Of course, this assumption, but actually we do not need. Okay, right? So this also go back to the SVM. SVM is go to the fixture uh, space. Suppose the dimension of the fixture space is very large. What is very large can be good to infinity, 
right? Uh, so that one, that is why they have the kernel uh, concept there. So if we say if the hidden layer can, mm, uh, so number of hidden nodes in the hidden layer can be infinity, okay, or as large as possible, then the question is, then the, <coughs> we have this conclusion. So tuning is not required. All the parameters in the hidden layer can be random generated. This is based on a lot of assumptions. Say suppose, given an output function, given output function g of the hidden layer, if there exists a method, okay, which can be used to tuning to find the appropriate, uh, proper parameters for AIBI. So that means there are parameters, we can have a parameter, we have a tuning method, BP method, RBF method, or SVM method, whatever method. As long as there is, there exists a, such a tuning method, which can be used to training our single hidden layer feed forward, okay, then such a tuning is not required. Such a method is not required. Hidden layer can be, then be randomly generated. That is given in this paper, okay. So, uh, and also a lot of assumption is G here should be nonlinear piecewise continuous. You can't just give a data function, then <coughs> no way. Yeah, please. Can you explain the difference between AI and BI? Okay, so this I, I highlight AI, BI, sometimes they can be put together, just one parameter, okay? But AI, BI here, because usually in the traditional neural network, you see RBF network, you have center and impact factor. So AI here in the RBF, hidden node, AI is center, BI is an impact, fa uh, impact factor. If we go to sigmoid function, AI is an input width. BI is the bias of the hidden node. So this is why, because these come from the traditional neural network. So especially for neural network researchers, usually they have two parameters there. So I, this is why I put AI, BI. But if we go to the uh, frequency uh, analysis, usually you have the position and the frequency, right? Not the location and the frequency, right? So usually have the two. What do you yeah, mean for SVMs? Oh, for SVMs, SVM, if you talk about kernel, later on I was showing, kernel you have the so-called the AI is the input, uh, uh, that is called uh, uh, in sample, training samples. BI is the uh, uh, so-called the uh, we call kernel, kernel parameter, that is sigma. But of course here we are talking about random. So later on we can build the linkage between SVM and, uh, and this method, okay? But of course here we are talking about random first. Okay, so, yeah. Excuse me, for uh, uh, um, any application, do you need to tune air? Or you don't need to tune air? Ah, Lisa, I will address this issue later. Yeah, these are, these are important uh, questions. I will come back. Yeah. Okay. So since a, uh, all the hidden node parameter need not be tuning, a lot of actually not be in tuning in the sense, before you see the training data, you can randomly generate the parameter first. Okay. Then say for this application, you can use the random already random generated hidden nodes for that kind of application. That means the parameter can be independently from the training from your applications. So since AIBI, uh, all the parameters, hidden node parameters can be randomly generated, then go here. Say so suppose you have n parameter, uh, n training samples. Given any training, any, say, any training sample xj. So we wish the output function, output of this network equal to your target, tj. Right, the left hand is the output of the network. We wish this equal to your target. So we have the AO hidden nodes. So here we have AO unknown parameters then. Only AO unknown parameters, beta i. Because we have no idea what is beta i. That is we want to find. Although the hidden layer can be randomly generated. The T, Tj is your target. So we have the n training sample. So from here we, we know we have the n equations with AO unknown parameters, right? So then, for this AO equations, we can uh, written then written it uh, can be written in the compact format H beta equal to T. So H is we call hidden node uh, output matrix, right? It's also the uh, so called the hidden layer mapping, okay? Feature mapping, okay? So we have the 
n hidden uh, n per, uh, training data, right? So each row represents the uh, output of the hidden layer with respect to one input training x i. Okay. So we wish to t is is already given. We want to find this parameter. So for this h beta equal to t, h is already known, t is already known. So then we can find the parameter beta easily, three steps then. So the first step, randomly assign hidden node parameters a, i, b, i. And then calculate the hidden layer output function uh, matrix h. All right? So then just do a third inverse, get the beta. That's all. So these are three steps, OK? So the source code can be found here. Uh, for this, we have found the simple math is enough in many cases. Of course, then for this single hidden layer, uh, feed forward that wall, uh, the hidden node, okay, needn't be sigmoid type, needn't be RBF type, it can be others, non say threshold hidden hidden node, because previously the threshold uh, letter wall can't be chained, okay, directly. So with this method, threshold network can also be chained. But that is a basic idea. So now, what's the relationship? Uh, yeah. <coughs> In the statistics community, there's something called generalized linear models, where you take the input data, you map it to some nonlinear thing, and then you just generalize it from there. Is that a good way to do this? It looks exactly like this. So how is it related? How is it related? Excuse me. What is a nonlinear? Generalized linear. Uh, where, you, where you basically map the data to a non-linear form and then take a linear combination of the, the works and find a linear combination. So it looks very similar to this. So I'm yeah. wondering what the difference is. Yeah, so th this why, so many methods actually look similar, but the, the key point is here, the hidden nodes uh, here all randomly generated. Because in other methods, they have to uh, so call either user preset, preset some parameters or either tune in some way, then get the hidden layer output. So then they use the least square method, even the original RBF method. So they have to do something before they go to the uh, random generated form. Uh, yeah? When you say that taking random, um, a random hidden layer is enough, then I don't understand what is enough means. I mean, does it mean that you get uniformly good uh, yeah. approximation across the input space? I mean, this can't be a distribution dependent thing. You can't get actual learning from this. This has to be assuming some type of uniform distribution on your input space. Okay. Well, the, is enough to talk about here. Say, given any target function, continuous target function fx, we can say, for given uh, such a kind of single hidden layer feed for a later work, may not be neural later work, okay? So, as long as the long, large, uh, number of hidden nodes is not enough we can say the output, fun output of this, hidden, this single hidden layer work can be as close as to your target function. So give any target function, any continuous target function, so that we can make the output of the letter work as close as to your target. So this, this is because from the learning point of view, in theory, we wish to have this universal approximation property. Right, but you give a little work. Sure. I think what you want is to get, you know, to learn the specific distribution of the problem you have at hand. So, oh, this is this is some <clears throat> kind of extreme L infinity type of, uh, or, or I mean, you, you're talking here about a uniform convergence right across the entire space, whereas you may actually care about some little part of the space which is governed by the distribution of your samples. I mean, that's what's supposed to that's what's the difference between optimization and learning or okay. optimization and learning. Uh, you're right. So talk about, say, you give an entire, so here talk about the uh, score error in the entire uh, interested uh, space. Of course, talk about uh, so called some specific space, that could be different. So this actually, this problem uh, actually uh, true to many learning methods, even go to the BP. They also talk about general. Even SVM talk about the overall space. Hey, given this region, we wish to, to learn to see how good in this entire region, instead of specific so-called locations, area, small area. But that is a problem to the general learning method. Because learning method usually say, give a space, given this training data, n training data, we wish to learn the overall performance on this n training data. Of course, sometimes we are also interested in some particular subsets, but that is a 
different ways then. I don't think I understood what I said. When we get a training set, we care about the distribution for which that data set came. We don't care about uniformly across the space. And an SVM specifically has an analysis. So the only learning and generalization analysis for SVM talks about generalizing with respect to the distribution of the training data, not uniformly across the space. Okay. You're talking about distribution of the training data. In which sense? In which sense? You're, you're assuming that your sample is IAD from some distribution. That's a distribution with respect to which you measure risk and you want to generalize with respect to. You don't really care about doing anything uniformly across the entire space. In SVM, for instance, the space is some infinite dimensional thing, and all you really care about is the subspace spanned by your data and the distribution over that subspace. So okay. here, this is, this is kind of a, you know. Yeah, OK. I, I will go back to your, your question <coughs> later, because later on we have a comparison. So why they find it can be, can be so-called, even so this square SVM can be simplified to, to this stage. OK, I'll come back later. Yeah. So. So that is the three steps. But then if we talk about these three steps, so usually we, after we get a beta, beta can be, say, uh, calculated through the pseudo inverse format. You have a different way to calculate pseudo inverse. So the, one of the ways is to get the orthogonal method. So we say we have the pseudo, get the pseudo inverse of, uh, okay, beta can, uh, so called the H can be in this way or in this way, right? But it, from the, Rigid regression theory point of view, in order to improve the stability, improve the performance of the pseudo inverse. So usually we wish to add a so called some a constant value in the diagonal diang entry of this part. So then we can add it here, right? So when after we add this one here, because this one is a, the usual way for us to handle the uh, so the inverse. So the, what's, the, what, what's the relationship with SVM then? Okay. So after we add this, then the, the issues become very interesting. If HX is long to us, this is different from SVM. As in SVM, HX usually is unknown. So if HX is long to us, then we have this. All right. If HX is unknown, we can also use the same format. We can use a corner format. So from the first formula, so H times H, then we get this corner format. In this case, as long as K is known to us, even the fixture mapping uh, function HX is unknown to us, we can get this formula. Okay, so this is another formula from uh, ERM, uh, from the ERM, okay, we, we mentioned in this paper. So then what's, what happens then? You compare these two. This is the solution of the ERM. This is the solution of the least square SVM. This square SVM, you see, if we ignore the first column, first row, first column of this least square SVM solution, the, this part, this part actually very similar to this part, right, to ERM solution. But then there, they here, of course, here we have the uh, k times k, here is z times z. So they have this one, okay? So roughly looks similar, but this actually is a simplified version of the least square SVM. Why this is a simplified version? This actually mentioned in, our, uh, in this paper, because we found that they may have some flaw in this square SVM and the SVM series I will mention later. But you look at the this square SVM, so you have the t, so Z here actually is a kernel matrix. Omega here is a kernel matrix. But then the problem is why in their kernel, kernel is a matrix is a related to the feature mapping. It should not be related to the target. But in their feature mapping, kernel mapping actually is related to the target. But this is a problem. So your feature mapping is coming from the input instead of you have feedback from the output, right? But in their Solution, they have a TI. Uh, so T, you have a target in the kernel map, uh, mapping matrix. Okay, so this is a problem there. But then from here, we have simplified. We ignore the first column, first row, first column. Then make it a simple, right? Uh, so I, I will come back later. So why this one actually can be uh, uh, so called, is can be uh, discussed. Uh, it, it may have something. Uh, uh, which can be improved somewhere, okay? 
So now let's look at the classification, uh, so called the performance of the ERM. So now let's look at the XOR problem. All right, so this is the output boundary of the ERM, which found by ERM. So we look at another case, right? This is also a boundary found by the uh, uh, so called ERM method. So now look, get back, go back to your questions. Do we need an infinite number of hidden nodes? Usually not. <coughs> so we say, uh, so as long as the number of hidden nodes is not enough, is not enough, then okay. So in what sense not enough? So in all our simulations, say even for this case, we only have four parameters, four training data, 1,000 hidden nodes. Even here, you have say here maybe 8,000 data, 1,000 training data. 1,000 hidden nodes. Even for other cases, we sometimes we have a half a million of uh, chaining data, okay, the case. We all just need 1,000 hidden nodes. So in that means, usually 1,000 enough. 1,000 to 2,000 should be fine for ERM, usually. This, 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 what do we find? Yes? Is that an empirical observation, or do you have a theory that actually suggests that that's Oh, no, we, don't, we do not have theory. This is just uh, from our experiment. Uh, ex experimental uh, simulation, also not only found by us, also <coughs> found by uh, some other teams from Europe and China. Yeah, so... The number of the you mean 1,000 is, is, is quite good, so you, is that independent of the originality? Ah, okay, for the moment we found it is, uh, looks uh, likely in, independent from the dimensions. Because sometimes, later I also show you, some is higher dimension, some is lower dimension, some is even several thousand, also okay. Oh, yeah. And also, when yeah. you say yes. thousand, do you mean you need a thousand to match the performance of a regular SVM? What do you we also compare with SVM, regular SVM later. But what, what, performance, what I'm asking is what performance are you trying to get? I mean, I could have two. No, we, we, we have this, we, we wish to to compare with the traditional SVM in the same meaning. Say, if they have the dimension related reduc reduction, then we compare in the same way. If they do not have the uh, dimension reduction, we also compare the performance without uh, dimension reduction. We wish to see the, if talk about classification, we want to see the classification read in the testing data. Yeah. 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 With the standard methods. And for that, a thousand hidden nodes is enough, usually. Sorry. If I understand you correctly, you want, you're comparing against standard methods. You want to match the error rate. You want to get yeah. the same error rate. And to get yeah, the same, same error rate, you need a thousand hidden nodes with the MPLM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the last? Sorry, I should ask to it. What's the largest problem you apply this to? Okay, so this is a problem because. Uh, you see, we, we, uh, ERM, the score scalability actually is very, very good because you see the function, that, that calculation is very, very simple. You, you look at here. This actually is unified for multi-class, multi-label classification also. But this here, similar to SVM, is just for binary. So if you want to handle large, very large case for SVM and not, this square SVM, usually you have a, a so called one against all, one against one kind of method for both SVM and this uh, square SVM. So usually we have to find the supercomputer for very large case. But to us, we usually run it in the home computer or just the desktop in the, in the, in the lab. So we, for our own case, we, the largest one we run is half a million of data. With uh, each, each so called data instance is uh, uh, say 59 input attributes, I will mention later. But for the rest, uh, because due to the compute, uh, so computing environment, sometimes very difficult. We have to wait for, sometimes wait for months to get the result out. So this is a problem. But for us, just uh, several minutes, we get a result. So sometimes we can't put a result there because we have to wait at the rest. So all the compute you reach probably apply up to half a minute. Yeah, yeah the maximum, the maximum. I will mention, I have one slide to show it, to show it. Okay. So what do you have you know, in terms of the variability when you try a different set of random parameters? <coughs> for, for the moment, we, we have so a... Like for the first one, you know, if you try different parameters, yeah, different different parameters right? you should have a given the uh, kernel of parameters. So um, a, a, B, I, yes. yeah, 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 that's right. We, we usually have to sim run, we, we, in order to compare with SVM and other methods, a lot of only SVM and like BP, we, to us, we, we, we actually, you know, just the hidden number of hidden nodes. That one usually can be, can be just given. 
then run for all. But for the rest method, you have to tune in this method, tune in that method. In order to find one method, even given one method, they have to spend a lot. Uh, so it will cost a lot of time for them complete. Wise, I'm, yeah, I actually have the same yeah. question as Jenny. When you actually use a random uh, generator to get this AB, yeah. how many runs do you have to no, get? So okay, you is just one. But you get the different uh, okay. result. For the result here, we later I show, we, we can generate many times. We see the average. We can see the average. So yeah. do, they, do they differ a lot? I will show you that. There are some standard deviation. That is a very interesting <laughs> result. You will see it. OK, let's look at these several data cases. Actually, not very large. OK, so they say uh, they have this case, the chain number of training data for letter recognition is uh, 13,000. Then testing is 6,000. OK, so then the, this uh, number of the input pictures, then class is here. So yes means uh, the data can be uh, so training data and testing every time during a trial are uh, reshuffled. The rest no means no shuffled according to, to the simulation done by others. If training data fixed, testing data fixed, okay? Uh, now, let's look at this case. So if we talk about the, uh, let's look at the, the lower part first. If SVM, this square SVM and EM all use Gaussian corner. Gaussian kernel here is not random generated. You look at the earlier solution here. I say if the hx is already known to you, you can use these two formulas. If hx is unknown, similar to SVM, but to us is needing to be tuning, right? So we can use the same format here using the kernel format. Right, this is different from this square SVM. We can also use a kernel here, because usually here, not, no, no tuning, just use okay, one parameter. Of course, for any method, no free none, you definitely have to do something for some, right, at least one parameter. So if we talk about a good kernel, uh, Gaussian kernel method, you see, look here. This is the testing rate for SVM, okay? So this is a changing time. This and this square method, you see the ERM. For all the method, for, for all the data, the ERM achieved the better generalization, the testing accuracy, classification rate. Okay, you see here, all better here. You see the time, if the same uh, Gaussian kernel, this time actually is all shorter than the SVM and this SVM. We'll call this square SVM is much shorter than SVM. Okay, so this is the using a kernel, kernel format, right? But if the you see the standard duration here also, zero, because the training data is fixed, right? Testing data is fixed, right? So then the, these three methods have the same, uh, almost the same the standard duration. So, yeah, so with the Gaussian curve, are you choosing the, the, uh, the widths randomly? Ah, uh, yeah. No, this is not, can This can This, we, we want to intentionally compare SVM, this square SVM, and ERM, if they use the same corner. That means compare them in the same, same uh, scope uh, environment. Of course, you have to choose the parameter gamma in factor for all these three methods, right? So this is, this is the uh, uh, one comparison. But if you, we, because ERM here, we say the hidden layer output function is unknown to us, but we can use in the kernel format, similar to the SVM, just kernel, kernel learning. But if the HX is known to us, it seems the RBF led work, sigmoid led work, the traditional neural led work. So then we say we're just using one method, sigmoid or hidden node, right? So then all the parameters are randomly generated. And the number of hidden nodes is set as 1,000. Then what happened? You look here, it's very interesting. You see the classic casing rate here, also higher, almost better than all the rest, right? And then, of course, because they're random generated. So some standard duration here. Right? Even the training data is fixed, testing data is fixed. You still have some kind of variation there, because it's true. Because every time you random generate, they have some kind of variation uh, there. But you, but you see the duration is not so high. All right? Yeah, How please. The standard methods get? Support vectors for this. Actually, this one, oh, I think it can be found from uh, papers. Uh, I can't re really uh, remember, but usually, well, the only reason I'm asking is if it had runtime, mm -hmm. it's going to be slower if you have 1,000 versus 10. You're right. Next page, I will 
because your commands, <laughs> your, your concern, okay? And uh, this, uh, so I will go back later. So you see the training time. So the training time here is much, much shorter than the SVN, and it is a square SVN. Even shorter than the ERM with Gaussian corner. Because when you go to Gaussian corner, you see usually we consider the fixed space go to infinity, I mean, in theory. So but the here, uh, comparing um, the sigma hidden node versus kernel, do you have general uh, statement as to which one is better in terms of performance versus okay. In terms of classification, in terms of stability, Gaussian corner is better because all you see a standard deviation here is zero. Whenever fixed, fixed, training data fixed, then the result is definitely deterministic. Right? But you determine the time Training time, this better, sigmoidal, hidden node. That means uh, so called long kernel based is better because the kernel usually we need to give the, we, so, so uh, we need to give too many hidden nodes. So usually 1,000 enough. But 1,000 enough, very good for very large applications. Because when you go to a very large application, the scalability of SVM and this square of SVM will be very headache, troublesome to us. But then ERM is better. Right, so this is. Uh, so I'm thinking about <coughs> what you are doing now. There is to use the random, this uh, sequence and all this um, whatever either sigma to extract features, right? Mm -hmm. And then after that, you just use linear classifier at the at the, at the top level. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah. So why is that feature a good one? I, I will explain to you. Intuitive. Uh, yeah, it's not. Even in the beginning, when I think of this, I when I thought of this idea, if I question myself, can it work? I can't find any natural phenomena in, at that stage. Oh, but now I find the natural phenomena. So I say this is a natural learning skill. I will, I will go back later. It's very interesting. I will go back later. So, uh, by the way, uh, so when you use SVN, the number of support vectors will be automatically determined, right? Yes. This number will be considered as the number of hidden units in your ERM. So do you have an idea what is the number of support vectors you get with the SVN? Okay. Usually, for SVM, what I found is, uh, is, is in some order related to the number of training data. If we talk about regression method, usually half of the training data will be used as the support vectors. You know, go to this page. I just run a, a artificial case, sin C function, right? Usually, as a very important benchmark problem to test the SVM performance, right? We have a five training, uh, 5,000 training data and 5,000 testing data. So training data, we intentionally add some noise there. Test data is noise free. So you will go to SVM. Of course, here we change it to support vector regression because for regression case. So you have the 5,000 data, training data, you see here, nearly half of them used as a support vectors, right? So this is why even in other case, we all usually say, the number of support vectors is very comparable to the number of training data. So we talk about very large scale, uh, large data set. The number of support vector, vector will be very huge. So then these go to the runtime issue that are raised by this gentleman, right? So you go to testing. The test time will be very huge for support vectors and this is square of SVM. But while the number of hidden nodes in SERM can be very short. Look at this case. Instead of fix them as 1,000, I just choose 20. You see the testing accuracy for this case, ERM already short smaller than, is better than SVN, SVR, right? The training time here is 10, uh, actually is 0, 0 0.1 seconds. You see the SVR is nearly 20 minutes, right? Uh, so this is, a, yeah, please. Say a thousand on E11 in this case, would it maintain the same accuracy or would it overtrain? Okay, these are different methods then, because we all have the different version. You have all the on the developing here for this case. We you because it's published in the year two thousand six, quite a long time ago. For that case, we did not include the constant value in the diagonal 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 entry of this of H, right? We, we do not include this I over C here. We just using the, the using a formula without I over C, this uh, part. Uh, for that, without that diagonal entry, you can tune in, you can tune, you can given the uh, number of hidden nodes. 
So then the number of hidden nodes, if you go back to see this paper, different from the backpropagation method. Backpropagation method is very sensitive to the number of hidden nodes. All right? You can go to the peak performance easily, quickly, then drop down quickly because overfitting there. But the wall is ERM usually have a very large range. So the performance, the general performance is very stable in a very large range. And then slightly de deteriorate. Okay? Of course, the number of hidden nodes in that sense, number of hidden nodes required in ERM is higher than number of hidden nodes in BP because every, every hidden node in the BP had to be tuned carefully, but to us randomly generate. But why is this? Uh, so called stable in a very wide range for ERM because everyone is random generated. So you have add one, one more or one less, usually more or less there. So in that sense, intuitive skin is more stable. This is why we have a neural network original the intention of the ERM. We should be so called tolerance. Uh, we should have some kind of redundancy. We should have some kind of error tolerance, right? Uh, but uh, for the original BP, it does not have this picture. Yeah, yes, please. So in the, that sense, there's no real tuning parameters? Ah, uh, yeah. So we usually, in this case, we're just using a golden section. Say 10 hidden nodes, too little, too, too few. Count, because you're incapable of learning. 1,000 too few, they just said 500. Just three steps, usually, in our simulations. We, we do not have to be carefully tuning everything. Yeah, so this is why even say in this case, number of hidden nodes have to be given, but usually can be, can be given very easily, just using a golden section, okay? Of course, this is a for regression case. I won't to repeat it anymore, compare it to BP, compare it ERM, and spot vector machine, okay? Now, you look here for parameters. BP, I have to tune in the parameters here. Of course, you also sometimes have to tune in the number of learning approach. Then the SVR, you have tuned the parameters. ERM, for that traditional one, you have to give the <coughs> number of hidden nodes. Of course, after we add the diagonal, en uh, diagonal entry in the formula, number of hidden nodes can be fixed, say just 1,000, without doing any tuning here. Okay? Now you need to tune C, right? Ah, you are right. But C, yeah, definitely. That means either you're tuning. Uh, even you tuning, uh, tuning number of hidden nodes here, but of course this is not sensitive, or either tuning C, but C also not so sensitive compared with SVM. That means you have to tune it, but it is not so sensitive compared to SVM, okay? Uh, this have to, I, I yeah. To that, so this, this slide seems like to suggest you need to use uh, much more uh, number of hidden units than the BP. You're right, I just mentioned, because the number of, uh, so called number of uh, the hidden, the rules of each hidden node in the BP have to be already calculated carefully by the BP, or it's just random. So sometimes it's random, run, re redundancy is there. But redundancy is good, help us to uh, remain stat stable in some case, right? So, so my question is, for large problems, or huge problems, mm -hmm. will this cause any problem? No. Yeah, you see even here, not too many even. Compare, if you compare with SVR, not too many. But as I just mentioned, if after you add the diagonal entry, number of hidden nodes can be fixed. Usually, we just fix one thousand, right? In in all almost all the test cases we have so far, just remain them. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me just have one question. I think uh -huh. this is bother me all the time. So suppose you compare the same network mm -hmm. uh, topology, you know, the, the same number of parameters, all that, and the way you are doing that, you fix the earlier parameters by by random number, yeah. then you optimize the one, the top layer. Yeah. And then, of course, you are not going to get as low error as I do both. Why well, optimize both? Well, I could actually fix whatever you have at the top level mm -hmm. uh, better. Mm -hmm. And then I can still have freedom to train the other one. Okay. I will get better result in the training one. So are you talking about the, uh, the training result or is it the generalization issue? Great, great idea. So, uh, question. This depends. So it depends which algorithm you are using to train your little one. Say, if you're using BP, then you're stuck in the local minimum. Even you can't go to the global optimum. No, I mean, I mean, oh, I'm saying that have you tried this experiment? I think I would, you know, uh -huh. certainly would do that. Uh -huh. You use whatever method to get whatever good result. Uh -huh. okay, and then you fix better than you get. Yeah, yeah. And then I fix those. I do back propagation BP to train my AB so that it won't be the same <coughs> as what you, 
random generator. I actually get no, better. BP, no, BP, BP won't get a better result in most cases. It may get a better result in some cases. Uh, what I say, it won't get the, BP won't get a better re case, uh, result in most <coughs> cases in terms of uh, accuracy, okay? No, no, I'm saying that, I mean, given that I use the same parameter that you learned at uh -huh, hand, uh -huh. I still have more freedom to adjust other parameters. Mm -hmm. I may not have to do BP, I will just use any, any even greedy search. I might get some lower error. Is that going to give you? No, so, definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, so that issue will be generalization. No, than the definitely the BP will get a lower general performance. You see why? Because when the BP have to tune in all the hidden nodes, in ERM hidden nodes are randomly generated, okay? In most cases. BP have to tune in all the parameters. Say we have 1,000 hidden nodes random generated. For ERM, it works. Then go to BP overfitting. Because, say you just have mm -hmm. one, uh, 100 data. You have using 1,000 hidden nodes, then this network definitely can't learn this 100 data because number of hidden nodes is larger than number of training data. It's impossible, right? The training data, training error can go to zero. Then testing accuracy can be good to, even go to infinity in some sense. Very huge because overfitting there. But the ERM is random generated. So, so in, 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 in which sense, the, why the ERM is better than BP? Of course, later I can give you ex, ex, uh, other reasons. One reason is here. When we generate the hidden nodes, we do not give the preference to training data. So that means the hidden node is, is, can be generated without seeing the training data. So let's see the testing data and the training data in the same rule. Give the same priority to the same. But in the BP, hidden node is tuning the base of the training data. In other words, it give the priority, give the advantage to the training data, give the buyers to the testing data. So in, in this sense, BP actually is over uh, uh, focus on training data, right? So they do not balance the training data and the testing performance, testing data. So in, in this sense, the BP is not good, okay? So similar to other method, okay? Now, you, you look at another larger case. We, this also appeared uh, probably in five, uh, five or six years ago. So we have this, uh, say, Harvard, Harvard uh, actually is uh, nearly six, six, 600,000 data. So 100,000 for training. Actually, later on, we also tested for Harvard meaning. You see here, SVM spent 12 hours for one trial. That means, suppose we already found that best parameters or optimum user specified <coughs> parameters. Uh, then how many uh, number of hidden nodes, uh, number of supervisors? So here you have 100,000 training data. So here is one third of them used as a supervisors. All right, this is go back to the, the gentleman, right? So that means for the wrong time case, the testing time will be very huge. So even you have the training network, Given application, your, the, the, the product or application based on SVM may respond very slowly compared to ERM. ERM only 200 enough hidden nodes for this case. Then the, for each training, just 1.6 minutes, right? Uh, so, but look, look here, that here is uh, roughly 12 hours for one trial. But in order to find the appropriate parameters, you have to run maybe 200 times to find the best parameters. So you usually have to spend one month to get SVM complete. But for ERM, as a, what I say, just several times. Okay, so this one. Now, let's go back to here. Why ERM is better? So for the key expectation of ERM is hidden layer need not be tuned. Okay, it can be generated before we see the training data. This is the first key point. Second key point is hidden layer HX should satisfy universal approximate condition. Uh, even I just mentioned, if even HX is unknown, we assume HX should satisfy this condition. And if HX hidden layer does not satisfy this function, that means given some application, you can't approach it, you can't solve that application, then what shall we use? Why do we need to use this method, right? Okay, so then we want to minimize these two. Actually, this is similar to SVM, but this comes from neural network theory. 
actually published quite a long time ago. Okay, this is uh, this is proved by a so-called uh, actually you, uh, UC Berkeley professor. UC Berkeley professor say we should if the training error is already smaller, we try to minimize the width of the norm of the width of the whole letter word. So then I combine then these two. Why not minimize training error as as well as minimize the uh, width of the whole letter word, right? So this then why we come here. In order to address why ERM is better than uh, SVM in most cases, we talk of just we compare this square SVM. From that we can't see the why, the reasons. Okay, we go back to the original SVM. Original SVM actually talk about this kind of uh, optimization target with inequality conditions, right? If we go back to ERM, we also use the inequality conditions. But we know HX satisfies the uh, universal approximation ta uh, condition. So we have in ERM, we have this target function. I mean, this, this is analyzed from optimi optimization uh, aspect. So then we have also have this condition. Look here. This different from SVM. SVM here add a B there, right? But in S ERM, no B there because by HX certified universal approximation. Given any target in the fixture space, suppose the separating boundary should pass through the origin in the fixture space. So without B, then we have this dual op optimization uh, problem for ERM. We only have this condition. That means we in order to uh, get a solution for ERM, we only need to find the optimal uh, Parameter alpha i, uh, uh, alpha i in this cube from zero to c. But look at the uh, this analyze in this paper. Look at the SVM. The problem comes because phi x in SVM is unknown. But unknown that means they even using polynomial method. But unknown that means you may not be a uh, phi x counter may not may not satisfy universal approximation condition. So this one they have the B, because in the feature space, right, the separating uh, so-called boundary may not pass through the origin in the feature space. So this one they add the B there. After they add the B, the problem here, in the dual op optimization problem, this condition will, will be generated. But if you generate this condition, then SVM face a problem. In order to find the optimum of I, like our parameter, how do we find? Not only in this cube, also have to find the parameter in this hyperplane. This hyperplane defined by this condition. This is why we have SMO method, right? To find the best parameter along this hyperplane in this cube. Look here. ERM find the optimal solution of I in this cube. SVM find the solution in the hyper, hyper plane within this cube. So which one has a better uh, optimal searching scope? This should be better, right? Because this solution, optimal solution here, definitely not better than the solution here, right? So then why this problem comes? This is why in my brain, of course, this I just added this morning, and not probably yet, so I, have, I wish to bring this idea here for discussion. Is there any flaw in SVM theory. Look at that. SVM. SVM is very great. I have to, actually I appreciate this uh, uh, work. Without SVM, definitely the computa computational intelligence research may not be so attractive, right? Okay, but the problem is, SVM always search the optimum solution in this high plane within this cube, right, as I mentioned before, right? So then the problems, given two irrelevant applications, they have to search in the, they may have to search the optimal parameter in the same hyperplane. Say, I give the two applications, x1, x2, x1, t1, x2, t2, okay? Application one, application two. One talk about weather forecasting. One talk about human face recognition. Totally different, irrelevant applications. But their target may be the same, whether good or not. 
this uh, face recognition, this man, yes or no, right? So the target is always T1, 0 or 1, 0 or 1. But according to SMM condition, they have to search that, they have to follow a uh, so called uh, uh, search the solution in the same plane. Even that these two applications are different, but their TI, target, class label may be the same. May be the same, right? So that means summation of I TI equal to zero, this condition is the same because TI is the same. Okay, weather forecasting, 500 data. Face recognition, 500 data. So in the weather forecasting, half of TI is one, half of TI is zero. Face recognition, target, half of them one, half of them zero, possibly, right? So then TI is the same in these two applications, but the application are totally irrelevant. Input XI quite different, dimension different, distribution different. But then the searching area of the TI, RI, same. So this looks not so reasonable. Different application, why the searching uh, so-called area the same, searching scope the same. You, if, 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 if the goal is to separate two classes, why is it, is it not a good idea? Uh, this is a problem. Because they are different applications, input dimensions, distribution, totally different. So here, they only talk about the alpha i. Alpha i, alpha i should be uh, some parameter for us tuning. This should not only be related to the target. Also, if we want to relate it to the training data, you should relate to the target and also some way but it input. But to the training data because if you optimize for another goal, this is yeah. a constraint. Yeah, you're right. So, so this is only related to the target in this sense. In other words, give the preference to the target. This is what I want to say. It, it, it's good to relate it to training data, but only related to the target at this stage. Either you relate. I mean, I mean, it is related to the training data because clear this is just a constraint. You have the optimization goal, which is related to your ah, training. You're you right. But for you will go to the relation uh, optimizing goal here. You see here, right? This is the optimize. So from here, this part only related to the target. But of course, I can't say this is totally wrong. I, what I find, my sense is, it gives the, it seems the BP, it gives the preference to the target. It, it looks, Two different applications, they want to link, even their in input distribution dimension totally different. But due to their similarity in the, in the, in the target, so they match them, make, make them close to each other. This is why I have some kind of so-called pre-reservation, uh, some kind of hesitation on this part, right? This may not be totally wrong, so this is why I put the question here. Is this reasonable enough? Okay, but then the, the reason is what I, Alanite, because this I for discussion only, okay? I haven't published this, 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 this I come this from this morning, okay, after I wake up. So, uh, because SVM is too generous to the fixture mapping, 5X, 5X is unknown. So in all the literature of the SVM work, you can't see, say, 5X has to satisfy universal condition. They, they can be anything. You say polynomial, even X squared can be used. Right, sometimes, right? But you can see that one, definitely, if we go to infinity, the output function, output of the later work can go to infinity also, right? So that may not be reasonable. But because the five fixtures mapping is unknown, so then they can't, uh, unknown, since unknown, they have a bias in the output because your target is here, your output, your, your fixture mapping is unknown, so they have some bias between the distance between your original target and your actual. Uh, uh, target, okay, actual output, so you have buyers there. Because these buyers there, so I, I think this is kind of con contradiction. Of course, this has to be verified further. This is just for internal discussion, okay? Yeah, we can discuss later. Okay, so this is, uh, go back to the, this method, right? Go, go to, even this analyze, we go to this method it, uh, for uh, ERM. It also works in this sense, we see here. We give some kind of uh, classification, uh, uh, testing uh, case here. So then we see uh, SVM method, ERM method. Of course, for this case, ERM, we, we said the lambda hidden nodes as 1,000, then C had to be tuning, right? Had to be given. 
then SVM uh, goes in, you have C and gamma. Of course, for ERM, we also can use uh, Gaussian kernel. But in, in order comparison, I didn't use the Gaussian kernel for ERM. So you see here, testing read roughly is always better than SVM. So that means they are comparing the same method. Here, ERM not comparing is this square SVM because both use inequality constraints. Of course, if we go back earlier slides, we are compare the same method in the this square method, right? Or the metric space. So, so the data size roughly is how much in those tasks? Yeah. Oh, yeah, this just show. Yeah, just a, this is is not showing the large data set. Even for here, for we say the high dimension gene selection case, right? So we have this uh, result. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, that is for uh, ERM for batch learning means all the data are ready. But in real applications, even especially in the in the uh, uh, so called industrial applications, right? So many data are coming one by one, or chunk by chunk. You do not know how many data you will have, and how many, when all the data will come. So this is a situation. So how do we implement something online? So this is why we have another one called online sequential ERM. I just give you one, uh, one slide here to introduce a picture. So the data may come in one by one, OK? Uh, they come in a chunk. The chunk size may be wide, 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 maybe wiring, maybe just one, maybe t sometimes 20 data coming, maybe one million, sometimes next time you just have, have uh, uh, so called 500 data coming, right? So we wish to have a little one, which can just learn the arriving data, okay? As long as this arriving data has been learned, this data should be discarded, should be removed from your system, right? So next time when the data coming, you should learn the new data with the knowledge which learned from the past data, from the historical data. But after all the data learned, data should be discarded. It is very similar to our learning uh, skill. <coughs> Say we, we, are, we study from kindergarten to the PhD, okay? So every semester we have new textbook. When we new, learn the new textbook, we go to the examination. Hey, this is a chunk of data. After we pass the examination, we discard the old textbook. We learn a new textbook, means a new chunk of data, right? But when we learn a new chunk of data, we learn some new, new data with the knowledge learned from the old textbooks. But do we need to go back to the old textbook? Of course, you can review the old textbook. Usually, just learn one, then ignore it. So this is the very natural way. So in this sense, we can implement this online sequential learning based on the original batch, uh, batch learning mode ERM. Okay, I just uh, skipped this part. Uh, online sequential learning is very challenging to SVM and other methods. Usually, many parameters have to be tuning manually, so very difficult to handle. Okay, even the, the, the training time is very huge in many, many cases, very trivial, very troublesome. So with the ERM, this can be done very, very easily, okay? So I just skip this part. Okay, so then give a summary. Oh, sorry, that <laughs> time. So usually it uh, can be done without tuning. Of course, we say without tuning means you have one insensitive parameter, say number of hidden nodes or the, the, the uh, so-called complexity penalty C, but usually, compared to SVM and other methods, this is not so sensitive. Just give one, just try one or two times, usually okay, right? Uh, it can be efficient for batch mode learning or the sequential learning. Uh, one part of uh, incremental learning I didn't, uh, was not mentioned here. Actually, it's all very interesting. This comes from our ERM theory. For ERM, ERM different from other methods, any major algorithms of ERM come from theory. So that means any algorithm with a proof in theory. Okay, any major theory in ERM can result in the learning method. Uh, so this is different from other methods. Other methods usually come from idea, but kind of proof. Okay, sometimes you can prove something in the neural network, but no algorithm to support. Say, you say number of, you say number of hidden can go to infinity. How do you implement it? That's a problem, right? Uh, so, uh, of course, ERM work for uh, different hidden nodes. 
uh, it also include kernel. If HX is non random generated, if H HX are non, you can also use the same as kernel as as main method, just using kernel, right? So HX can be ignored. Okay. So then here is, uh, of course, learning is very fast. Usually, you say SVM can be some some method on this square. Say for one case, three or seven or right to complete one case. Then yeah, just uh, even less than one second. So in, in this case, in this sense, it can be. Can we do something on real time learning? Okay, and especially also the online sequential learning can also be uh, used in uh, real time cases. Then the next two, this I morning I added. I just uh, mentioned. So ERM all if we talk about the traditional SVM, okay, even talk about the least square. Traditional SVM, traditional SVM search the best result in the hyper plane within the cube. If we compare the same method, ERM search the best result in the entire cube. So in this sense, ERM always provide a better general performance because definitely won't won't worse than the result generated from a hyper plane in that cube, right? And uh, also. The same, same. No, no, SVM usually has a bunch of No, the same. The same. You, you look here. Uh, this actually. The dimensionality is different. The same. You have more. No, the same. Dimension. You see here, you look at this. This is the uh, optimization target of SVM, right? So NTI, TI, Phi I, okay? You see here, the same. And, and so but in the. But in general, the N used in SVM is much bigger than the N used in the. No, in your N area. here, the same. N here is the number of training data. Training. So you say the training data is same. Uh -huh. Then we, we use the same kernel, same fixture mapping, phi in SVM. So H in ERM, they use the same one, say, for example. And then the condition for ERM is here. The condition for SVM is, yeah, add one more. Right, so use it better because we uh, in in ERM case we request feature mapping satisfy universal approximation even online should be because if you you can't satisfy universal creation that means some black hole there, right? Some some case you can't be. I, I, can, I haven't followed much about this universal approximation because people typically consider to be theoretical engine. Now in your case. For the universal approximation can need to be held. Uh -huh. Do you? I, I remember a long time ago when people wrote proof that uh -huh. universal uh, approximation uh, condition, they have to assume that you have to do certain amount of learning. Uh, I can't yeah, sure, yeah. Maybe, maybe we can. Oh. You can do You have time. To okay. Yeah. Later. Yeah. Okay. okay. So then, similar to this square SVM, the same case. Okay. The same case. So then, go back to your earlier question. So why ERM say random generate good? Okay, the intuitively speaking, why is it good? So in the in the beginning, in the five years ago, I have no idea. Then I always try to think of some idea why is good. So I always talk this story to my students and also other researchers. Okay, in the beginning, even myself, I do, do not be. So what is the natural phenomena very similar to this case? Say Chinese China, right in China, Hangzhou. I have West Lake, right? Uh, Wuxi have a West Lake, uh, so called Taihu Lake, right? So lake, we want to fill the fill up the lake, okay? A river. You see the bottom. Bottom is a curve. Bottom is a function. So two type of people to fill up the lake. One is engineer. Another is farmer. So how does engineer fill the lake? Engineer have to pump out all the water, measure the curve of the bottom to see what's the size, what's the curve, sampling, get the training data first. And then, okay, so they're training that. Then do a lot of research. How many students I can use to fill, the, fill up the lake? 1,000 1, students, 10,000 students, or 100 students fill the lake. You move the stone to fill the lab. Of course, fill the lab means go to the horizontal, right? It's horizontal, okay? So each stone used by the engineer looks like a hidden node. So then the engineer had to measure, had to calculate, 
where to put this one? This one's so big. Put it here, maybe overfitting, too large. Put there, so they have spent a lot of time. Find a location, right? If 1,000 feet is still not enough, can we add another one? Where to put? So this is the BP learning method. Now, farmer comes. Farmer has no knowledge, right? It's very, it, it does not know how to do calculation. Very simple. Good, we have a lot of mountain, the Himalaya mountain, using a boom to explore the whole mountains. Then generate the random size of stones, rocks, big size, small size, even sand. So then how the farmer feel that they use a truck. Random, right, pick random number of stones, random number of size of stones, push to the lake. Random, put here, here, here. What is that? That is random generated. So when the lay, uh, farmer use a truck to take the stone, does he need to know what's the size, what's the training, some of the training data from the lake? No need, just random generate a stone. Then put random here, here, here. So which one faster? Of course, farmer's method is mo much more efficient. And does the farmer care about how many stones need to be used? No need. As long as the needs a square arrow means the arrow smaller, it's okay, right? So then what is the beta in used by the farmer? For the engineer, he has to calculate the size, the height of the stone. But farmer can go there using something just smash the stone. If this is too much, right? We suppose the, the beta indicated the height of a stone. Right? If the beta equal to zero, the height of the stone equal to zero means nothing. Even you put a stone there, that means hidden node put there, you can smash the stone to make the height of the stone zero. So definitely, farmer method is more efficient. Am I right? So then even for farmer method, does it care about do you have 1,000 hidden uh, uh, stone or 1,001 hidden node? No, it doesn't matter. Even if you have more, it doesn't matter. I can smash the height of the stone make the beta become zero, right? Even if you have 10 minutes, it doesn't matter, all becomes zero. So this is why ERM works, right? But there's an interesting uh, analogy here. Uh, actually, I, I appreciate what you said earlier on that when you randomize you know, your lower layer uh, parameters, you don't need to have all the data. Huh? Uh -huh. and, then, and then in that case, you minimize sort of the early decision in terms of the discrimination. Yeah, right? yeah. And there is actually similar kind of uh, technique now in neural net people develop. I don't know what you thought. It's not in, in maybe different community. It's mostly in NIPS community. <coughs> uh -huh. oh, they NIPS. actually talk about this uh, RBM, uh -huh. restricted bottom, bottom machine. They have a similar kind of philosophy of not using the target uh -huh. in initializing parameter. Uh -huh. But they actually use the data for reconstruction of the data to make sure that whatever hidden you, you might have, you get minimum error in restructuring the data, but if they discard entirely the, 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 the output. Yeah, yeah. And once they do that, <coughs> they actually tend to do better in the conditional uh, uh, back propagation. Yeah. S starting with the random motion. Yeah, this is possibly right. This is why. Similar kind of, yeah. Uh, I, I think so. They may have some kind of uh, common so called sense behind. So that means. When we do hidden layer, we, some parameter may not be related to your target. No, but the whole power of that approach is that that allows you to build the represent layer by layer all the way up there. Uh -huh. So that comes back to some of the ELM uh -huh. coming to see whether you actually use this not only for one hidden layer, but <coughs> keep building up the layers uh -huh. using similar kind of philosophy, maybe randomizing yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're great. Great idea. So here we, we talk about the hidden layer. We say the hidden layer HX. So sometimes we say uh, HX is unknown or HS is something else. It's not just hidden one hidden node. It may, it may be a, a lot of little work there. Maybe a lot of hidden layer there. So, so you will show that when you build more yeah, you layer are, by layer for this. Yeah, that's right. We didn't show layer by layer, but in our in our theory, we say HX may not be just a single compute, uh, single hidden node. It can be uh, just any kind of computational hidden node. It just it can be a lot of network, uh, a lot of layer. 
but in theory already prove it. You should try to see whether you build ah. from the lower up, you get better results. If you do that, then we can... Yeah, they may be more it. powerful. But, but in, this, in this case, we, we haven't tried it yet. But that is uh, one of the good directions. In theory, we, we have something related. That means HX may not just a, a so-called RBF hidden node or, or some kind of kernel. It may be a computational, other computational node. It can be a system even. So we somehow so this is why I do not uh, inten uh, in, uh, uh, intentionally use uh, neuron here. I wish to use a node, a computational node. This can be a system. It can be a single output function, whatever. Okay, great. Yeah. Last question. <coughs> yeah. Sorry for the scheme. So I'll ask it this. Uh -huh. I have actually have a couple, but I'm going to ask it. the small one. So you know, online learning. Uh, scheme. So, would you have to like uh, uh, incrementally sort of uh, adjust the number of hidden nodes? Okay. So, uh, actually, we have the two type of uh, learning methods for online. So, one is called online sequential learning. So, here is the many focus the case where the data coming one by one, or chunk by chunk. Or in this case, the little architecture is fixed. Is fixed. So then whenever the data coming, of course, some parameters of the little have to be tuning, especially for beta output width. So a lot of uh, uh, so-called technical we call incremental learning. Of course, this def may def definition may be different from others' incremental learning. So that means the data is fixed, or the data also coming, but the network architecture can also be updated. So then, so both the parameter and network architecture can be updated. That, that is another one. Uh, that is also very, very efficient. We prove in all the cases it is better than SV, SVR, support vector machine for regression. That is actually past, pa, already published in the uh, so called, uh, uh, actually in the TNN. That, that is uh, also comes from why, okay, that is, uh, let me show here. <coughs> that, that is published here. Uh, so this is why this proof, this theory actually generated that algorithm. Okay, actually this theory also come from that algorithm. We consider intuitively that algorithm works. Then how to prove it? Uh, that is a very very uh, difficult to prove. We have to appreciate the the, the fair review, professional review from uh, this journal and also the editor, past the editor in chief of this journal, where it, that a review tech Took three, it took three years to complete the review, seven reviewers. Of course, in the first version of the, of the paper, the proof is totally wrong. But then the reviewer very kind and said, the result is right. So then we, I work with my student, try to create the proof, but all proof is based on a lot of published paper. Actually, the proof in that paper was wrong. So then we did note note the proof in that paper wrong. So we take a long time and find oh, the proof in that paper wrong. So then we try to correct. But I correct my, my student also from the math department. So then he said we may be able to use the proof in that paper. So we try to correct the proof in that paper. So then we try to do it. But just the one week before we submitted this paper, we also found that no, the all correction is also not correct. <laughs> so then we totally ignored. Then we use the topology method to correct it. So finally, it works. <laughs> so this uh, is a uh, very interesting. But but uh, so finally, we we the the algorithm generated from that theory actually is very very efficient. I, I just took out these uh, slides this morning because I found that too many pages here. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Let's thank. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>